essentially all of the chemical reactions we've looked at so far go to completion. And by completion, we mean that all of the reactants are converted to products at the end of the reaction. That basically when things stop happening in the reaction, we can be assured that all of the reactants have been converted to products as long as they're present in the right stoichiometric ratio and, and all that good stuff. So an example of a reaction that goes to completion is the combination of silver plus ion and chloride minus ion in aqueous solution to form silver chloride precipitate. This reaction doesn't go backwards. That means if, for example, we start with one mole of silver plus and one mole of chloride ions and we mix those two solutions together, then at the end of the reaction, assuming we started with no product, of course, we're going to end up with one mole of product and zero moles of both of these things. So the reaction has gone to completion and we can use the tools of stoichiometry to predict, for example, how much product has formed. There are many reactions that go to completion. We've seen examples like this precipitation and others, but there are other types of chemical reactions that do not go to completion. In that case, at the quote-unquote end of the reaction, we don't have just the product present. We have some leftover reactants present. And through other means, which we'll talk about a little bit later in this chapter, we can verify that not only do the reactants A go to the products B, but the products B actually revert back to the reactants A. So we actually use this arrow pointing in two directions, a forward arrow and a reverse arrow, to indicate that this reaction goes in both directions. It's what we call reversible. When we're dealing with reversible reactions, we can't just use the tools of stoichiometry like we did up here. The approach to predicting, for example, how much product we're going to have at the end of a certain amount of time involves somewhat more complicated conceptual thinking to get us to a correct value. Here's an example of a reversible reaction. The decomposition of N2O4 gas to form two NO2 gas molecules. And this reaction, as we can see here, proceeds through cleavage of this NN bond that links the two NO2 fragments together. This is a reversible reaction, meaning that not only can N2O4 break apart to form NO2 molecules, but NO2 molecules can reassociate to form N2O4. So we can see, for example, that in Hong Kong on a smoggy day, we have a lot of the brown NO2 present. That can reassociate to form N2O4, which might be colorless, but the N2O4 can also break apart to reform NO2. So this is a reversible process. Let's imagine we're in a situation where we have a reaction vessel that has a lot of N2O4 present initially, that colorless gas. Initially, the reaction proceeds fairly rapidly, forming NO2, and we can see that in the bottom trace over here as the concentration of NO2 is rising. But eventually, we reach a point where, for all intents and purposes, the reaction appears to stop. The concentrations of both NO2 and N2O4 appear to be constant over time, and in fact, if we could extend this curve out to infinity, those lines would not adjust as long as our reaction conditions did not adjust. The reaction appears to have stopped, and so we appear to have a balance between the forward process and the reverse process. In that situation, we're in a state of what's called chemical equilibrium. And the word equilibrium is meant to evoke this balance between the forward and the reverse processes. We'll have much more to say about the definition of chemical equilibrium on the next slide. But for now, what I want to convey is that equilibrium is about balance, a balance between the forces that are pushing the reaction forward, in the forward direction, and in the reverse direction. When those two forces are balanced, we're in a state of chemical equilibrium. And what we see on a macroscopic scale, measuring these concentrations macroscopically, is that they remain constant over time. Remarkably, we can reach the same equilibrium concentrations starting from a different situation, namely starting from NO2, starting from what we've called the product, quote unquote, on previous slides, with none of the quote-unquote reactant present at the start of the reaction. What we find in this situation is that the reaction very rapidly runs in reverse, at least relative to the way we wrote it before with N2O4 on the reactant side and 2NO2 on the product side, right? In this situation, the reaction initially is running in the reverse direction very rapidly. However, we do eventually get to a point where the concentrations are more or less the same over time. And once again, if we could extend these lines out to infinite time, we would see that the concentrations would not change. 
So once again, we've reached chemical equilibrium, starting from a different set of initial conditions, but still reaching this state where the concentrations appear to be unchanging with time. The question arises here, after the state of chemical equilibrium has been reached, which is indicated by this dotted line right here, has the reaction ceased entirely? In other words, are the NO2 molecules just not converting to N2O4? Is the N2O4 not converting back to NO2? Has the reaction completely stopped? And naively, you might think, well, of course, right? If you look at the traces, the concentrations aren't changing. So how can the reaction be occurring if the concentrations of reactants and products are remaining constant? The answer is that the reaction can still be occurring on a microscopic level, but if the rates of the forward and reverse reactions are balanced, then we would expect to see no macroscopic change in the concentrations. And in fact, this is exactly what's happening in the chemical equilibrium state. What we're plotting here on this graph is not the concentrations versus time, but the reaction rates versus time. We're again starting in a situation where the concentration of N2O4 what we've called the quote-unquote reactant, is high, right? And so, naturally then, with no product present and the concentration of N2O4 large, the rate of the forward reaction is going to start out fairly large, and that's why it's fairly high up on the y-axis here. But over time, as the N2O4 is consumed, consistent with some ideas that we've seen from kinetics in, in previous chapters, right, the rate is going to decrease. And as in O2 builds in over time as it forms, its rate of the reverse reaction is going to increase as well as the concentration of NO2 increases. One rate is decreasing, the other rate is increasing, we eventually must reach a point where the two rates are equal. The magic of chemical equilibrium is once these two rates are equal, they will remain so forevermore. There are no further changes in the concentrations of reactants and products once those two rates are equal. This is important to appreciate. It's really important to appreciate that these rates are not at zero. The reaction is still occurring on the microscopic scale. It's just that for every molecule of, for example, N2O4 that's consumed by formation of NO2, two molecules of NO2 are consumed via the reverse process, and the two rates are equal. So from our macroscopic perspective, it appears that no change is happening we can define the equilibrium state of a chemical reaction as the state in which the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. This is, for our purposes, one of the most important conceptual definitions really in the entirety of 1212K because we're going to see many different applications of chemical equilibrium and many of them, especially when we get to Le Chatelier's principle and what happens when equilibria are disturbed, are going to be based on this idea that not only are the forward and reverse rates equal at equilibrium, but they are not equal to zero. This allows a reaction at, at equilibrium to do some interesting things when conditions are changed. For now, though, keep in mind this definition of the equilibrium state. It's when the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. All chemical equilibria have this property that the rates of the forward and reverse processes are not equal to zero, at equilibrium. They're what are called dynamic equilibria. We can contrast this word dynamic with the word static. A static equilibrium involves no change at all, right? We might think of a static equilibrium as one in which the reaction rates truly are zero. However, all chemical equilibria are dynamic. Molecules are always colliding with one another, trading atoms, reacting with one another. It's only when the rates of forward and reverse processes are balanced that we see no macroscopic change, that doesn't mean that change isn't occurring at the microscopic level. That's very important. The fact that chemical equilibria are dynamic is actually quite useful because dynamic equilibria respond to changes in reaction conditions. So for example, we can alter the temperature to push a reaction in one direction or the other. And sometimes we need to do this, particularly for reversible reactions where the concentrations of reactants and products at equilibrium are very finely balanced. You may look at a reaction like this and wonder, well, if we have at equilibrium one mole of A and one mole of B present, how can we ever expect to use this reaction to produce, for example, more than a 50% yield of B? Well, as it happens, thanks to the dynamic nature of equilibria, 
there are ways by adjusting the reaction conditions we can push the reaction towards products and away from reactants. We can cause the forward process to dominate over the reverse process or vice versa. If we wanted more of A for some reason, we wanted A not to react in this process, we could bias the reaction in the opposite direction using a similar idea, this idea that dynamic equilibria respond to changes in reaction conditions, specifically variables like temperature, pressure, and amounts of reactants and products. And we'll have much more to say about this in discussions of Le Chatelier's principle.